After you make your bridge and you're ready to start your stringing process, you're going to want to make sure that these holes will fit your pins. So first step is to take a pin and stick it in there without a string and see if it goes down to the bottom and it, these do not. The holes are small because I always err on this small side. You can always go bigger. So I drilled these small and knowing that that would be tight, I'm hoping that my little peg reamer, this is just a violin peg reamer, will fit down in here. Now this may not fit in here yet, honestly, because I did drill them pretty small. I drilled these with a 3 16 so I'm going to get a 64th bigger than that. Okay, so 13 64ths is the next size up from uh, 3 16 That's really all it takes. The only other thing you want to do is clean off the inside there because there will always be a little bit of residual on the inside. And then of course you're going to want to shake out that residual out of the guitar entirely. Now that we've drilled the holes out a little bit larger, the technique I use is I put my hand, my finger under the hole, I take my violin reamer and I start it down and I stop as soon as it touches my finger. Right there it's touching so I stop. Right there, it's touching. This technique works really well. I have not found any technique that works better than this. I'm sure there are other options. But you see how quick that is. It's not very, doesn't take very long. And it does a really nice job. As you're stringing your guitar, one of the things I would like to recommend and stress is that you file off the tip of your peg. And the way you do that is you, you find the groove in the peg and you file basically across that groove and you just slope it towards the other end. You don't have to go all the way to the other end, you understand. All you're trying to do is just create a little slope. What that does is when you push this down past your string, the little ball on the end of the string will then hit that little slope and slide up so that the ball is pulled all the way up to the top and this goes past the ball. If you don't have that on there, it is a chance that your ball will get stuck on the end of your pin and then you know your string will be down in the guitar further. That does happen quite often. And occasionally you'll even see, like I've seen it many times, where the pin actually gets pulled out of the guitar while the, while the a person is playing the guitar and that's because the string pulled the pin right out. So put that little slope on there, that'll never happen. You don't absolutely need to do it, but it's a good idea. And the other thing I do is I keep this pulled up to the top as I'm sliding the pin in. So I, I kind of lift up on the string as I'm pushing the pin down. And there you go. So that way we know we're at the top, the pin is in place, and we can move on. When you're stringing a guitar, there's many ways to do it, just like there's many ways to skin a cat. I will show you my technique. This technique I use only on the base side of the peg head. So this first technique that is, just like before, you put the string in and you have your peg beveled. You kind of lift up on the string as you're pushing the peg through so that you know that the peg is on the bottom of the guitar or on the bridge pad, I should say. Then the technique for the actual stringing is to just simply put the string in the groove where it belongs, go around the peg this way, so from the inside out like this, then you go around over the top of the string that's here, so you go back over the top, and you go around yet again like that, that keeps this string at the bottom of the peg and that's what you want. You want to wrap your string so that the winding is at the bottom of the peg. It's very important because that's a leverage point and that makes your, your tuner much stronger. And then once you get back around there again, you find the hole and you go back through the hole and you go over the top of all the st strings that you've wound so far. 
So this going through the hole now is at the top. When you use this technique, you just pull it up tight and your, your string is already basically tight. So it takes just a few turns, only a few turns and you're already tight. So you don't even need a string winder or anything. So there you go. Very simple technique. So I will show you this technique once again. You first attach your string back here and you have your peg beveled. You slide it in past the, the ball on the string, push it in and you lift up at the same time so that the string is bottomed out there on the bridge pad. You bring your string up and put it in the appropriate slot from the inside of the peg head and you go around the outside of the post like this and you wrap it tight. You're pulling tight as you're doing this and that way your string will already be tight. Then you find your hole and you go back over the top of the strings you've already wrapped like that and then you just pull it up tight. And once you do that you lift it up straight so it's pointed straight up and then you have very few turns on your tuner and you're already tight. Then you take your nippers and you nip off your string right at the top of the post. Some people will say, what if it slips? It's not going to slip if you use that method that I've shown you on this side of the peg head. On this side, we will use a different method and I'll show you that. The technique for stringing the treble side is a little different. You put the peg in the same way, of course, lifting up and keeping it tight to the underside of the bridge pad. You come back to the peg head. You do not need to find the slot at this point. What you want to do instead is go from the inside of the peg head out through the hole like this. The hole doesn't have to be perfectly lined up that way, but you just, you just make sure that you're coming from the inside to the outside like that. So you're pulling up about that much slack. You don't pull it all out. Then you go around the outside of the post back to the underside like that and you bring the string up under this string here. So you're going under this piece, you're pulling around the post tight and then you just lift up and wrap it over the top of that string. Then you find the slot you want it in and you take this hand and you lift up with the string like this. Now you've got quite a bit of slack here as you can see and you start your wrap. The difference here is that you're going to do more wraps this way and it's going to be a little bit more cumbersome, but the reason you do this side this way is this is locking this end of this string in where it can't pull out. This side, you don't have to worry about that. On the base side, it won't pull out anyway. But this treble side, if you don't get enough wraps around the post, it can pull out. But this locking technique that I showed you where you go back under and lift up, will lock the string in perfectly. Even though I don't have the string tight, I can already, with confidence, cut the end of this off. No problem at all. And just go ahead and tighten it up. Now in this case, I will use a string winder, mostly because my arthritis wants me to use a string winder. That just takes a few seconds. I'll show you that technique one more time. Okay, the string has been mounted in the bridge as previously shown. I'm going to go from the inside of the peg head back through the hole to the outside like that. Pull up most of the slack out, but not all of it, like that. Go back around the outside of the post this direction and come back under the string, grab it like this, pull it up tight around the post, lift up and bend it over the string. Now you lift, pull this tight, that string is locked in, it can't come out. I can even already with confidence cut that off and we won't have any problem at all. And then you start winding and the only thing you want to make sure is that your winding goes down the post. In other words, that first time you go around here you want to make sure that you're below the string that's already there. And as long as you're below that string, then your winding will continue down the post just like it should. And again, you can go to your string winder if you prefer. And that's all there is to it. 
You got a nice neat job without all that extra frizz hanging around up here. You don't want extra string hanging around up here because that will give you a sympathetic tone sometimes or a sympathetic buzz. You'll hear a buzzing sound and you'll wonder where it's coming from and it can be these loose strings. You don't want loose ends up here. Now that we have this guitar completely strung up, we don't have it tuned yet, so we want to tune it. There's still several more steps to a good setup. So let's tune it and get every string just right. I'm going to do that off camera because there's no point in showing you that. I'm sure you know how to tune your own guitar. Once you have your guitar up to pitch, you're going to want to check several things to make a good setup. The first thing that you may want to check is your action height and you're going to want to check it in two places. You're going to want to check it at the first fret and you're going to want to check it at the twelfth fret. Now the twelfth fret is denoted by the two dots that are in the side here on most guitars. Not all of them have that. So you may actually have to count or look at your inlay. You can kind of tell by that also. Uh, I'm going to check this one and see where we landed. We're probably very high. Yes, we're very high. This is 120 thousandths. That's too high. This is about... It's probably close to 120 also. Okay, on the base side for your, I would say your average that you want to achieve is about 90 and the average you want to achieve on the treble side is about 80. 90 and 80. That's kind of your average. You can go a little lower than that, but once you start going lower than that, you better make sure that everything is perfect because it will be very difficult to get it to play right unless everything is perfect. So 90 and 80 is kind of your average, and that's a good setup guitar at 90 and 80. Your incredibly easy to play guitars will be down around 80 and 70 and there are a few that you can get slightly lower than that but very few really 90 to 80 is a real real good target 100 to 90 is not terrible just so you know just to give you some reference now that now that we know that this side here and I'm going to double check it is just about 120 and this side here is really close to that also. I'm just going to say it's 120 also. It's, it's really difficult to say for sure. What that means is we need to drop this down. So to get this down to 90, that's a 30 thousandths difference. So I would have to take 60 thousandths off this side here. You need to double whatever, whatever you need right here. You need to double that number and take it off on your saddle. Now, before you do that, you want to check your, your nut up here, just, to, just kind of as a, a sanity check. Make sure that there's some clearance here. If this is already touching and you start taking it off back here, this is going to buzz for sure. We're high here, I can tell, by a good amount. Not crazy high, but we're high, and so I think we can get away with taking it off back here without too much trouble. So you just kind of have to have some experience at that. Okay, so I'm going to take off, um, you know, to, to drop this 30 thousandths of an inch, I'm going to take off 60 thousandths of an inch back here. And that's going to be quite a bit. On this side, I could actually take off more to drop the treble side down a little bit more. So I'll probably take, say, 65 off of this side and 60 off of this side, and I'll show you how I go about doing that accurately. At some point, you'll be going back and forth on this. So the easiest way is to loosen up all the strings, pull the pegs on just the base side. That's the way I do it. And retain your pegs somewhere you can pull three and maybe get away with it or you could pull four and it'll be a little bit easier so I'm pulling out four now I'm gonna walk the saddle out and I'm just gonna use my little pliers here and just barely grab it and lift it up on the end and then you just walk it out from under those strings like I said, you could actually leave three strings here, just take the base side off, and you could still walk this out. But I'm just showing you the easiest way. 
And now we're going to want to mark this to, to uh, do our work. The way I typically mark this is I go to the bottom, this is the treble side, on the back side of it, and I mark it like so, and just put a black mark there, and I put another black mark right here. Then I take my calipers. These are not the high-end, high-end calipers, but they're kind of the middle of the range. These are produced by eye gauging. It says Easy Cal. If there was a model number here, I would tell you, but I don't see an actual model number. It says IP54, which is probably the model number. But anyway, you set this for what you want to remove. So we said 60,000 on this end and 65 on that end. So I'm going to pull this up to 60 thousandths. And it's very difficult to get it exact. So you got to really monkey with it a little bit to get it just where you want it. There's 60 thousandths on the nose, and then you tighten it down so it doesn't move. Then you can scratch this. You, you take the one edge, and you just barely drop it below the edge there, and then you scratch the 60 thousandths in there. And you can probably see the little white scratch there. Then I want to go just a little bit more on the other side. So I'm going to go to 65 and got lucky on that one, it went real easy, and then I'll scratch it also. Now all you do is you take this and you slide it into your sander until those marks touch the sander, and that's it. Just slide it in and you kind of keep your, you know, you'll have to do this, but you want to keep it flat and keep it one, one continuous sanding mark and you make them both touch at the same time and then you pull it away and you're done. So that's all there is to it. You saw how we put the little marks on here and now we're going to slide this into a sander. Now, here's the thing that you can do uh, to help you uh, control this. You, you notice there's a gap here between the table and the sander. If you don't fill that gap, this could get pulled down in the gap. So you don't want that to happen. So what I do is just take a piece of heavy plastic, slide it here. It could be a piece of plywood or almost anything. And that, you know, closes off the little gap there. Then you can slide this into those marks much more confidently. I think you can see that we were able to confidently slide this in to those lines just start to disappear. That's your perfect spot right there. After you sand the bottom of your saddle off flat, it's a good practice to just knock the very corners off with a, with a file and very lightly like I'm doing right here. You can see what I'm doing. I'm not putting a lot of pressure on it. I'm not doing a lot of work. I'm only dulling those corners. And what that does is those corners can catch on things in your slot and not let it go to the bottom. And so you just want to dull that off and, and make it smooth because otherwise they're pretty darn sharp after you get done sanding. We're ready to install the saddle back in there. So we'll slide it back in there. And this saddle is going to be incredibly low to this bridge. We may have to cut this bridge down just a little bit. Probably will. I'm going to see if it'll string up without doing that, but I have a feeling we're gonna to need to cut the bridge down. In fact, I'm almost positive we will. I think I'm just going to go ahead and tighten up the one E string and see if there's going to be pressure on the saddle here. If there's no pressure on the saddle, then you're going to have to take measures to get pressure on your saddle. In my case, I can see that there is actually a slight bend there. It's not very much, but as long as there's a bend there, you're probably fine. What I'm going to do, though, to just make it better on, in this case, is I'm going to actually drop the strings down in a slight small slot, just very slightly. Because the neck angle on this guitar is really on the borderline, what I'm going to do to get a little bit more pressure on my saddle is I'm going to go ahead and put slots in the tops of these string locations. And that will let the string drop down just a little bit more so that it can pull down on the saddle, because that's what you want. If you don't get enough pressure on your saddle, you either get buzzes or weird sounds or it won't intonate properly. There's all kinds of problems. You want to make sure you have some pressure on your saddle from your strings.
So in order to cut these slots accurately, it might be a good idea to pencil a little bit of a mark in here so that you can kind of visually see where you want your slot to be. And then I'm just going to go ahead and get it cut. Done properly, this technique is perfectly fine to do. It's also done when you have a very low saddle and there's really no other recourse other than perhaps resetting the neck or something like that or cutting the bridge thinner and thinner to drop the bridge itself so that you can so that the strings can hit the saddle. The reason I didn't want to do that is I didn't want to weaken this top because this top has a lot of bow in it and I wanted to keep the thickest bridge on here I could possibly keep to help keep this top flat. So I chose to put these little grooves here. Some people don't like that, but when it's justified, it's the thing to do. And in this case, it is definitely justified. It would be too expensive to reset the neck on this guitar just to fix that one little problem that we fixed this way. Well, quite honestly, it didn't take it down as much as I was hoping. It should have, but it didn't for some reason. And we're still around Oh, 95 to 100 on this side, which is okay, it's within the range. And this side is about, just about 90. So we're 95 to 100 over here, about 90 there. You know, if we had gone just a little bit more, it would have been better, there's no doubt. But this is perfectly within the range. Now, the thing that we haven't done yet is set the action here. If you drop it here, you will drop it here a little bit too. So this will probably give us enough to bring us back down even into the better range. We're in the range now and we're fine and it, it would play perfectly well this way. But when we drop this down a little bit more, it's even going to play that much better. You probably know by now, but I'm a big believer in using common sense practical approaches to pretty much everything on guitars or instruments, whether you're building them or setting them up. So one of the most practical methods for setting your action at your first fret is to take a pick similar to this Martin Light pick. And when you measure this on your calipers, it's going to measure about 16 thousandths of an inch, I believe. Let's just check it. I'm getting 17 thousandths right now. Okay, so that's not bad. That's perfectly fine. You can't really tell the difference of a thousandth of an inch. It's so minor. Okay, so anyway, so we have this and, and, and you, then you can press down on your string. Now I am getting a tiny bit of deflection there. That means that it will, we can lower this some. And another test that you can do is pluck the string and then slide the pick in. So you can barely hear it buzzing. So that means we're really close, but it's, you know, we can still see some deflection there, so we can file this down a little bit. Now this is where we go into the discussion of the nut. The nut is very critical to the playing of the instrument, to the sound, to avoid buzzing and all kinds of problems. Tuning issues, you can have tuning issues here if the nut is not cut properly. What do I mean by that? There's a myth around that you have to cut these slots the exact same size as your string, and that's a total, absolute myth. It's, you're far better off cutting these slots a few thousandths of an inch bigger than your string. So if you're using a, 50, 000, a 56 thousand string, a 60 thousandths slot would be just about perfect. The reason is that four thousandths, you can't really see it. You'll have two thousandths on either side, but that all that does is allow the string to move in that slot without hanging up. If you made it the exact same size as the string, you may accidentally not get it that that wide for one thing and num and number two is the string can hang up on the sides and buzz and rattle on those sides you don't want that we are using a 54,000 string here so let me find a pr an appropriate file I have a 56 thousandths file for a 54 thousandths uh, string now that's pretty good, but the problem is if you go to bigger strings later, this will be tight. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rock this a little bit. Before we start, notice down in that slot, you can see it's black. 
and I've already knocked a little bit of it off. But if you watch that, that's your best friend for filing these slots perfectly. What you want to do is set your file at the angle of your peg head and you want to stay consistent to that. You don't want to rock like this. You want to stay in that same plane and you want to start filing this slot and you want to file a little bit, take a look, file a little bit, take a look, and you want to see that dark line just disappear and at the back edge here. And that's what we're going to do. So I'm going to file a little bit. I'm going to take a look. And if you look now, the front edge of that is off, but the back edge is still dark. That means that this slot is not filed perfectly with the peg head. And that's what we want. Okay, it's almost there. Almost there, still not quite. Once you get it there, and I've just got it there just now. I'm going to rock this a little bit now to knock the sides down because I don't want the sides to hang up on the string. I'm not taking it off the bottom now. I'm just rocking the sides. And now I'm going to put this back in here and test it yet again. I'm going to bring it up to pitch because I, by the, by the fact that we've done that, we may have just solved the pinching problem already. We don't know that for sure, but this string could have been pinched and it could have been setting up and it may have not been setting on the back edge of this or the inside edge of this. This inside edge is the last place that this string should be making contact. You definitely want it touching this inside edge because that's where your intonation starts is right there. You do not want it riding in the middle of the nut because that would make the fret the string longer than it should be. You want it to be right on this inside edge, the last place it touches the string. Okay, so we'll bring this up to pitch. And then we're going to test the action again and see if we're still high. And we are about the same. We didn't really change anything yet. And let's just test it with by sound. You can see it's still about the same. It's just barely, barely, barely touching. Okay, so I'm going to take just a tiny bit more off of this. Now, this is where you have to be very careful. You don't want to take much more off of this than you have to. Again, I'm going to rock it just a little bit. Now I'm not really hitting the bottom now. I'm just kind of cleaning it up. And that may be enough. I just get it approximately in tune and I test it again. And quite honestly, that's just about perfect because I don't even see any movement at all now. When I'm pressing it, it, I don't see any movement, but yet I don't see the string lifting up when I put it in there. So that's where you want to wind up, right there, especially on these bass strings. As we move across, you can actually have the string lift up just a tiny amount when you slide the pick in. But you'll just have to learn that feel. But this is just absolutely perfect. Now we're gonna to go to the next one here and see. We can see that it does move up and down, so we're going to want to, uh, you know, drop that one down. And see, it doesn't even buzz when I slide it under there. Listen to that. Doesn't even buzz, so it's not touching that string at all. So we definitely are high here. And once again, we're going to use that very, very same technique. The string on this, I believe, is a 42. And I do happen to have a 42... Uh, file here. Now that would make it tight. I don't really want it tight. So I'm going to look and see if I have a slightly bigger one. My next bigger one that I have is a 50. Now some people would say that's way too big. Trust me, you'll never be able to tell that it's bigger than the string. So I'm going to take this 50 and, I'm, and I can tell that it's going to be wide. I'm going to be widening this uh, slot out with this 50 because it's pinching it already. And that's okay with me. I'm perfectly fine with that. I'd much rather have the slot wide than narrow. Wide is your friend. Narrow is not your friend. It's your enemy. Okay, and again, I'm following this peg head, and I'm checking it here, and I can see 
If you look close, you can see that the front and the middle has been filed, but the back edge has not been touched yet. So there you go. That's your friend. You want to use your friend there. And now I'm getting just a bit. There, it just went away. I know I'm high, so I'm just taking just a hair more. And that's a little bit risky because the string could have been pinched and it could have been held up in the air. But I'm going to go ahead and I took just a tiny bit of a risk there by taking, dropping it just a hair more. And I bring it up to approximate pitch there. And then I'm going to test it again. And quite honestly, we're very close. We just need to drop it a little tiny bit more. Let's see about the buzz test. Still doesn't even buzz, so we're, you know we're definitely high. Okay, so let's take it off of there. And again, I got my 50 thousandths file here. And I'm following my peg head angle perfectly, keeping my file exactly in one plane. By the fact that I have a wide, wider file, I don't have to rock it now. That's probably all you need. You don't need to do much when, you get that, when you're this close. Okay, we're close to tuning, and so let's slide this in. Now I don't see the string move at all. It's not moving at all. It doesn't move when I slide it in there, and now it will buzz when we pluck it. You can hear it. See it? So there you know, you're just about perfect. I don't even see it move at all when I press on it, yet I don't see it lift the string up either, so that is absolutely perfect. You continue on doing all your strings that exact same way. You can get away with just a little bit lower on these bottom three strings. A little bit. When I say a little bit, I mean like you might just, in, just barely see this lift the string as you're sliding the pick under there but I mean just barely. And that's really all there is to it. Now that we have the nut completely filed on this guitar, the thing to do is to go back to the 12th fret and see where, you're, where you landed, because you will have lowered it a little bit more, not very much, but some. Okay, we're really close to 90 now, so it's really right on 90. That's just literally perfect. That's a perfect target spot to be land. This should hopefully land on 80 and boy we're just a hair over 80. 84 thousandths is about where we're at there. So that's plenty fine. That's just perfectly good. Four thousandths of an inch is the thickness of a single sheet of paper. That is like nothing. So there you go. We're, we're just perfectly fine. That's set up just about as well as it can be set up. As always, you can always do more to an instrument, you know, understand. We could have reset the neck on this, and that would have been very expensive, very costly, very time consuming. Instead, we chose to use other methods. We got, we dropped these strings down just a little bit, we got the saddle as low as we could, we got perfect, you know, uh, height here at our 12th fret. When you get 90 here and 80 here, you're good. So we're about 90 and about 84. That's perfectly acceptable. It really is set up very well. The uh, setup down here is about 16 thousandths and a little less on the treble side. So that's perfectly fine. Well, now we'll play it for you to see what it sounds like. You would never know that was a plywood guitar. I don't call it a plywood guitar to put it down. I just want you to understand what we're dealing with. We are dealing with plywood. Plywood is multiple plies of wood. A laminate is like your kitchen countertop where you have a formica laminate on top of a substrate. They use the term laminate to pretty it up to put lipstick on a pig. And I don't mean pig in this case to mean it to be derogatory. This guitar sounds awesome. It's a plywood guitar. 
it sounds awesome, so just get over it. It's just that simple. It'd be very, you'd be very hard pressed to go out and spend a lot more money and get one that sounds a whole lot better than this. Let's just check the intonation now just as a final step to see where we landed on our intonation after all that work. I have not checked the intonation yet. I just want to be honest with you. I truly have not checked it. So I don't know where we landed, but we're going to find out together. So here's the E. I got to get it right on the center. It's pretty close to center, open. Now we'll note it. We're about six cents sharp, maybe three cents sharp. About three cents sharp, that's not bad. That's not any kind of a problem area. There's your, there's your A string. We're really close, maybe two cents. About two cents sharp. About one cent sharp, if anything. I have to get the str string just right. That one's right dead center. That one's the G. There's the B. about eight cents sharp. We could on that one potentially file the B string back a little bit, which you see on a lot of guitars, but I tell you what, even seven or eight cents is not bad. That's maybe six, seven cents, so it's not bad on the B string. Let's try the E. All things considered, and considering how much work this guitar really needed when it came here, you know, to be able to pull it off without a neck reset, I think we've done wonderful. necessarily be afraid of a plywood guitar. They're just fine. Of course you need to play them to make sure they sound well, but uh, if they're set up well and they sound good, what more do you need? Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Yeah, yeah.